All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. Today's video is a beer that I have been extraordinarily excited for for a very long period of time. The last time I brewed a Belgian Dark Strong Ale, also known as a Belgian Quadruple, uh, was about four years ago. Uh, in 2018, when I made my Christmas Spice Quadruple, which I still actually have a few bottles of left over in somewhere. It was, it was a pretty good beer at the time, and um, it aged pretty well, and I, I was pretty happy with it, but at the end of the day, it was too complicated of a beer. But when I went to Belgium recently, I had the opportunity to taste some of the best Belgian Dark Strong Ales in the world, like Chimay Blue and West Vlaterin 12. And I also learned a tremendous amount about how they are made and uh, how I had kind of gotten things a little bit wrong the last time I made my quad. So today we're gonna take a fresh crack at the Belgian Dark Strong Ale, and I am gonna try and brew the best quad I possibly can using all of that experience. Now, while this is not the first video in the Belgian beer series, um, it is the first beer of them that I am making chronologically simply because a quad needs a long time to age the bottle condition and smooth out because of its strength. So we're just gonna get an early start on that. I'm brewing this about a week and a half after I got back from Belgium. Just absolutely no time wasted there. Belgian Dark Strong Ale is probably my favorite beer style of all time. Um, it is, there is something about it that is just different than other dark strong beers like Russian Imperial Stouts, Baltic Porters, that sort of thing. It's just different. There really are very few beers that can come close to matching the complexity that you can get with the Belgian Dark Strong Ale. And in my opinion, it's just something about the drinkability combined with a high alcohol percentage combined with just all of those very, very hard to get fermentation flavors like higher alcohols like rose and floral character married up with some nice caramely goodness in the base with some just beautiful uh, just molassesy, sugary notes that just really all come together in a package that is actually not too sweet and um, it just ends up being a really nice experience. What you're going to notice about this recipe in particular, and especially compared to many other dark strong ales out there, including the recipe that I made four years ago, is that this is so much simpler. These beers and their complexity are delivered through two primary ingredients. Well, actually three primary ingredients. The first is dark candy sugar or dark candy syrup. This is a caramelized molasses or treacle-like sugar that is going to deliver a tremendous amount of flavor complexity and ferment out almost completely but leaving its nice flavor compounds behind in the form of melanoidins. And the second and third ingredients are the magical ingredients that Stan Hieronymus likes to call them. And that is yeast and fermentation and thyme. And I think the second ingredient is probably the most critical. Yes, you can make a good tasting Belgian dark strong ale in two weeks. Um, it's going to be a good beer. It's probably gonna be a bit harsh at first, but it's going to be a good beer and you'll probably enjoy it. But it's not going to even hold a candle to what it can be if you let it sit in the bottle for three to four months. And that's what I intend to do with this beer. So right now it is the tail end of March. Typically these beers in Belgium are aged for two to three months uh, before they are distributed, but they even sit on the bottle on the shelves for longer than that as they need to. These beers are going to get better and better with age up to about two years where they start to kind of fall off a little bit. Provided you bottle them properly and you don't have any oxygen ingress, these beers are going to be delicious for years to come. Do yourself a favor, don't drink it all at once. Be patient, let it sit. In general, you're gonna to wanna to be keeping your recipe simple as possible. The monks do not live complicated lives. They simplify every single aspect of their lives and that includes the brewing. So there's no need to make a super complicated grist for your beer. Focus instead on process to try and get those flavors out that you want. The other thing is using continental ingredients is incredibly important. So we're gonna be wanting to use European or specifically Belgian Pilsner malt, European hops, the proper yeast for the actual beer style, and also just a water profile that's going to be relatively neutral. I thought about this long and hard while I was there, and I really think that all of their water is relatively balanced, not going heavy towards the chlorides like you might expect with some of these beers. I think it's actually a little bit lighter and more balanced and less minerally than we think. I could be totally wrong about this, but I'm gonna try it in this video. And the last secret ingredient I think is gonna be a step mash, just to try and make sure that we can get the best attenuation possible while still retaining a fair amount of body, but most importantly, spectacular head retention. So I'm excited to get into this recipe, but before we do that, big thank you to Northern Brewer for providing me every single ingredient I needed for this batch of beer. Every ingredient that I'm brewing with is available on Northern Brewer's website, so check them out if you want to make this beer for yourself. 
there is a link in the description for them. Secondly, Clawhammer Supply, they are the company that manufacture the equipment that I brew on. And I've used their system for over a year now and it has been fantastic. Every single brew that I've made with it has been a great experience. So again, there's a link in the description if you wanna check out that system. I do highly recommend it. The recipe today is a big one. We're targeting an OG of 1.100, uh, which is gonna make for a pretty boozy beer as intended. So don't be surprised when you see some pretty large numbers. So first of all, we're gonna start out with 15 pounds of Dingemann's Pilsner malt. You could split it 50-50 with Belgian pale malt as well if you want, but I'm gonna stick with just Pilsner here. We're gonna to add to that one and a half pounds of standard Weyermann Munich malt. This is just something to add a little bit of breadiness to it, uh, but nothing that's going to overwhelm any of the other flavors. We just wanna be able to carefully bridge that delicate Pilsner character with the nice flavors of the sugars, and I'm gonna use Munich malt to achieve that. On top of that, we're gonna add two specialty malts, and that's it. The first is Special B, which is a Belgian dark caramel malt. Uh, that is gonna be responsible for some nice figgy and nutty and dark roasted caramel notes uh, that are going to be a nice background to the sugars. And then on top of that, we're gonna add three quarters of a pound of aromatic malt. Aromatic malt intensifies the malt aroma and the malt character that you get out of a beer. If you add a little bit of aromatic malt into something, it's gonna act like Munich malt on steroids and it's gonna give you this really rich maltiness in the beer. And that is something that we want. That's all of our grain. But on top of all that, at the very end of the boil, I'm gonna be adding in two pounds of D180, which is a candy syrup. This is a dark candy syrup, which has been heavily caramelized. And that is gonna be responsible for a large portion of the malt flavor and this the general just richness that you get out of a Belgian quad. It's also going to help us attenuate for our hops. We're going to be using just a single hop for bittering. That is Magnum. We're going to add three quarters of an ounce of Magnum at the 60 minute mark during the boil, although we are doing a 90 minute boil. So there is just going to be a 30 minute period of nothing added to the boil at the beginning. But then we're going to add that three quarters of an ounce at 60 minutes in order to get a nice crisp, smooth, clean bitterness with no additional hop character. For our water profile, like I said, I'm targeting something relatively balanced. So this is gonna be our water profile. We're looking for 60 parts per million of calcium, six parts per million of magnesium, 18 parts per million of sodium, 79 parts per million of chloride, 62 parts per million of sulfate, and 47 parts per million of bicarbonate. And in order to achieve that profile, I'll be starting out with eight gallons of distilled water in my Clawhammer supply system. This is so that you can copy this water profile exactly for your own usage. So to achieve that water profile, start out with your distilled water or RO water and add in two grams of gypsum, two grams of Epsom, five grams of calcium chloride, and two grams of sodium bicarbonate or baking soda. For our yeast in this one, we're gonna be using the Westfleeter and strain slash the West Mall strain slash the Ockel strain also known as YU 3787, WLP 530, or Imperial Triple Double, which is the variation that I'll be using just simply for cell count. We're gonna be using a two liter starter of this, especially in a beer of this high gravity and a beer where you're gonna push the yeast as hard as you will with a Belgian quad. You're gonna want to make a starter. And in this case, I'm gonna specify the actual cell count and the actual pitch rate that I'm intending to use so that you guys don't have an issue. I'm gonna be making a two liter starter with a approximately about 500 billion cells of active yeast. That is a pitch rate of approximately 1 million cells per milliliter per degree Play-Doh. That is a pitch rate that's a lot higher than the Belgians use, but I need to make sure that this beer actually does well. And I think a little bit extra yeast is gonna help with that. So in order to make that starter properly, you're gonna actually pitch 200 billion cells from the Imperial uh, packet into two liters of a 1040 gravity starter wort and put that on a stir plate for a couple days. Now, if your Imperial yeast packets are older, like mine were, mine were manufactured in January, you're only gonna have about 100 billion cells of viable yeast in them. So in that case, make sure you pitch two packets of Imperial yeast to get yourself up to that proper cell count. Be careful about that. Be very deliberate about your pitch rates in very high gravity beers like this. And then for our mash, we're gonna be doing a step mash. Now this is not gonna be a super complicated step mash like you might do for a traditional Czech Pilsner. Instead, this is gonna be a two-step mash. We're gonna do a 45 minute rest at 148 degrees Fahrenheit, and then we're gonna ramp up to 158 for a 30 minute rest. 
what I'm looking forward to is a very fermentable and a very clear wort. This mash schedule has produced extremely clear wort for me in the past, and it uh, should do the same thing here, and that's gonna help cut down on some of those proteins that can cause haze. This is a beer that actually should be clear. Even though it's dark, it should come out as a ruby red with some nice dark undertones, and it should be brilliantly clear. And on top of that, you should be seeing a really well-structured head that has like I said, spectacular head retention. That's what I'm intending to get out of this mash schedule. So with all of that said and put together, let's go ahead and get this thing going. I added eight gallons of spring water to my 10 gallon claw hammer supply, 120 volt system and started to heat it up to the mash temperature. I also milled out my grain and added all of my water salts to the water at this time. Once the water had finally reached the mashing temperature, I mashed in at the first rest temperature of 148 Fahrenheit and started to recirculate the mash. After about 10 minutes though, I took a pH reading and I saw a pH of 5.64, which was actually a little bit high, so I added a very small amount of lactic acid to bring it down a few points. Once the mash had rested for 45 minutes at 148 Fahrenheit, I raised it up to 158 Fahrenheit. Then I raised it up to the final mash out step of 170 Fahrenheit and let it sit there for 15 minutes. After that, I pulled out the grain basket, let that drain for 15 minutes. At this time, I also set the controller to 100% power to get a jump start on the boil. Once the basket was finished draining, I removed it and uh, continued on towards the boil. Once I reached the boil, I did nothing for 30 minutes and then I reached the 60 minute mark and then I added my 60 minute and only hop addition, three quarters of an ounce of Magnum hops. Then I let the boil continue for 50 more minutes and added in my two pounds of D180 candy syrup at 10 minutes stirring well to avoid scorching and ensure the entire thing was dissolved. I also added in some world flock and some yeast nutrient. Ten minutes later, I ended the boil, and then I began to chill down to the pitching temperature of 65 and transferred into the fermenter. I took an OG sample using the Easy Dense, and I saw an original gravity of 1097, which was only three points short of my target. At this point, I pitched my entire yeast starter, and I left it to ferment. So the brew day went very well, everything happened according to plan, which is always a good thing and doesn't always happen. But we need to talk about fermentation for this beer, and I need to spend some time on it because this beer is made in the fermentation. You can't just pitch your yeast and walk away and expect it to be good. It's going to require some fine tuning. Like I said, I'm going to try and target a higher pitch rate, a more Americanized pitch rate, um, to ensure that my fermentation stays healthy. But what is going to be critical is temperature. Typically, the Belgians will ferment all of their beers with a free rise schedule. They'll pitch their yeast at about 65 to 68 degrees and let it naturally free rise up to a certain point. Different breweries will cap their fermentation temperatures at different levels. So West Mall, for example, only goes up to about 72 degrees before they decide to say, hey, that's enough, and let the yeast finish out controlled at about 72. Whereas West Vlederen, on the other hand, will go all the way up to 82 degrees with their yeast, which is quite hot and a little bit risky. I'm gonna park myself somewhere in between at about 78 degrees as my maximum. I'm gonna let it go, free rise all the way up to about 78 degrees, however long it takes. We just don't want to stall this yeast out. It has a nasty tendency to drop out, stall, and just give up halfway through fermentation if you cool it off. So let it do what it wants, uh, bring it up to 78, 
let it stay at 78 for a couple days. That'll finish off the fermentation, take consistent gravity readings, and when it gets down close to its final gravity, at that point, we're gonna be able to start bringing it back down. What I'm looking at is bringing it down to about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. This is gonna begin an extended conditioning phase where it is going to drop all of its sedimentation out slowly over time. It's gonna clean up off flavors that were produced during the beginning of the fermentation, things like fusel alcohols, things like diacetyl, that's Sort of thing it's going to clean that stuff up over that extended conditioning phase this is going to last for about two weeks then i'm going to take it off the yeast put it in a keg and get it into my fermentation chamber where i will lager it that means bringing it all the way down close to freezing and holding it there for a couple weeks probably about two to three weeks that is going to rapidly drop solids out of the beer and again make it more clarified from that keg then I will bottle. So I'm using the keg as a secondary fermenter. Secondary fermentation is not a thing that we do all that often, but in this case, I think it might actually be a useful thing. Now this beer can be keg conditioned. You can prime a keg as if it was a bottle and serve it off of the keg at the right carbonation level like you would with a bottle conditioned beer. However, for this beer, I am going to be uh, saving it as wedding gifts. So it's gonna end up in bottles anyway, so I might as well bottle condition it anyway. So from that keg that I'm gonna be conditioning in, I'm gonna bottle it and then we'll prime it from there and leave it in the cellar temperatures for probably the next several months uh, until it is ready to drink. Now you can use different yeasts for this, but keep in mind they're gonna behave very differently. You can use Chimay's Strain, which is available as uh, T58 dry yeast, if you want to use a dry yeast, or the Lalaman Abbey Ale yeast is also the same strain. Yeast 1214 and WLP 500 are also the same strain, they're Chimay. Um, you can use a Rochefort Strain, which is Yeast 1762. I don't know the White Labs version of that off the top of my head. Now, if you do choose to use a different yeast, you're gonna want to make sure you do some research on what is the proper way to ferment that yeast. You know, when you think about what the extended back half of that fermentation is gonna look like, that's gonna vary for different yeasts as well. So just be sure you're doing your research on that. Now, during this Belgian beer series, you should be seeing different yeasts being used and you'll see different ways to work with them. So hopefully that gives you some tools if you wanna choose a different yeast for your fermentation. The one thing that you must not do is ferment this with kvike or ferment it under pressure. Those are great alternative methods for fermentation for plenty of different beers, but not for Belgian beers. There is no replacement for the Belgian ale yeast. For Belgian beers, specifically Trappist styles and Abbey beers, you need to use Trappist style or Abbey ale yeast. And you cannot ferment it under pressure because it will kill off all of those esters. You need to push that yeast, not necessarily stress it, but just push it to its utmost limits, and then you will get that character that you need, and you need to take care of that beer properly. These beers, especially dark strong ales, are not easy to make, and they do require a lot of careful planning and a lot of management of that fermentation, but at the same time, let the yeast do what it wants to do, and don't baby it too much. You need to relax, not worry, and have a homebrew, and you'll probably be all right. So now that it's in the fermenter, I'm gonna wait a very long time and follow that fermentation regimen that I explained to you earlier, but it's gonna probably end up being around 10 and a half to 11% alcohol, uh, which is gonna require some time. So I will see you in several months. Primary fermentation was completed very quickly within a week, but continued to slowly drop a few points each day over the course of several days after. So I saw a final gravity of about 1019 after about two weeks of fermentation. At this point, I bottle conditioned the entire brew and I primed it with candy syrup and a little bit of Lalaman CBC1 bottle conditioning yeast. I kept the bottles in the cellar for the next six months, letting them condition and develop flavor at temperatures that range between 55 and 65 Fahrenheit. I gave a bunch of these bottles away for my wedding, but I kept a few on my own and in late September, decided to crack one open for this video. This beer is called Mother of Quad, and it comes in at 10.5% ABV and 22 IBUs.
So for the appearance of the beer, it looks like it pours a dark brown, dark black color, but it actually really is truly a deep, dark shade of ruby red. Um, when you hold this up to the light, you can actually see that it's brilliantly clear. And also you can see that there's those nice red, ruby-like undertones that just make this beer absolutely beautiful. So it's, it's really more than anything, it's just a dark shade of red. It pours with this wonderful tan-colored head. Um, it builds nicely, has a lot of really fine, tight bubbles. It falls rather quickly, but it really has a solid layer that stays on the surface. So it is now about six months since brewing this beer. Uh, I brewed it in the middle of March and now we are in the middle of September. So it's aged for a pretty solid amount of time and it's gonna start coming into a really good period of tasting very good. I wanted to get this video out now so that you guys can brew this now and have a Belgian quad ready for the middle of the winter. It's really best to let these things sit and age and develop as their flavors and complexities really come out with that age. Let's go in for aroma. Ooh, aromatics on this are really very chocolatey and raisin heavy. It smells sweet and a little bit of spice in there as well. Darker uh, fruits um, and like kind of almost like a, a cinnamon like spice. Very aromatic, even in this wide glass. So now Let's go in for mouthfeel. This is also the first time that I will have tasted this beer in about three months. So I'm very, very excited for this. Oh my God. <laughs> we'll get to the flavor in a minute. Man, I really outdid myself. Mouthfeel, very light, very, very smooth. Um, no kind of harsh edges to it, no roundedness either. It's not creamy, it doesn't have any fullness to it. It's just very smooth and very light. Um, there is good carbonation in this. It is dry for this beer, but the substantial amount of alcohol does add a lot of body to it. Bottom line is it's a very pleasant mouthfeel and it's really, really very enjoyable. I carbonated this in the bottle to about three and a half volumes of CO2. So it is heavily carbonated, just like all Belgian beers should be. And that really comes through in terms of carrying those aromatics out, building up that massive head and then adding that kind of spritziness to the mouthfeel. So this is the most important part and the thing that I am dying to get to, we are gonna talk about flavor now. <laughs> Oh, this beer is incredible. Um, now that I've given it the time to age, this is absolutely nothing like it was three months ago. This is a completely different beer, entirely. Uh, this has richness to it that it didn't used to have. It's got this really nice, almost semi-sweet Belgian dark sugar kind of character. Um, by that I mean like the dark fruits, dark raisins, dates, plums, but also it has a little bit of sugar sweetness behind it, very reminiscent of molasses, very reminiscent of maple syrup almost in terms of uh, just hints of that sugariness. It's not sweet. Now, keep in mind now, this is not sweetness directly. This is alcohol induced sweetness. So it's really your mind thinking that it's sweeter than it is, but those flavors of raisins, dates, and, um, and other dark fruits kind of trick your mind thinking this is a sweeter beverage than it really is. We also have really good malty character in this. There's a little bit of a biscuity, bready base to it and truly a fantastic balance in the maltiness. Um, holy crap. There's a slight breadiness, a little bit of kind of like a Munich-like character coming through as well, but it really is dominated by the dark fruits and the kind of um, molasses-like sugary character that is so, so rich and complex in flavor. There's no alcohol warming in this. I cannot tell that this is 10 and a half percent. I'm drinking this as readily as a 6% beer. 
there's some spice to this as well. I did not add any spices. This is the magic of that West Flutter and yeast. The spices that I'm getting are vanilla, along with some cinnamon, some orange, and a little bit of nutmeg. Kind of like almost a Christmas spice character, but it's extremely subtle. Extremely so. This is absolute heaven in a glass. This is why it's worth aging your beers. So many people don't, myself included. But this is the reason why it's worth it. This beer tastes absolutely nothing, nothing like it did before. Three months ago, this was tasting almost astringent. It was good, it was definitely drinkable at the time. It had some of the characters that I described, like the dark fruits, um, but it was extremely bready. However, it's missing those little spice nuances like the vanilla and the cinnamon. It was missing the richness above all. It was really just more of like a dark bready character that had some sugar notes on top of it. And it was, it was definitely good, it was drinkable, but it wasn't anything close to like what it is right now. This beer is nothing short of incredible. I do wish it had more esters. So I submitted this beer to the National Homebrew Competition and it did okay. Um, didn't meddle in anything, but I got some very interesting feedback from the judges. One of the things that they mentioned was, you know, it lacks the classic ester profile. It's a great beer otherwise, um, but it needs more esters. And that's an interesting comment because I fermented this uh, and actually got all the way up to 82 degrees during the fermentation, which would create excessive esters, um, but I did pitch a lot of yeast. But I do agree with those comments. It is missing that. Uh, it, it needs little bits of like a bubblegum note. It needs a little bit of, not necessarily a banana, but maybe a little bit of a pear, a little bit of an orange peel character. These are all esters that you can get out of this yeast uh, in order to be the really best version of itself that it can be. And in order to achieve that, I think I might want to pitch a little bit less yeast in the next version of this. It has absolutely no fermentation related off flavors in it. There's no fusel alcohols. And that's the major risk when you pitch a slightly smaller amount of yeast into this high, high gravity wort. Um, so there's a couple of levers that I can pull to get more esters. Either pitch a little bit less yeast or I can possibly aerate a little bit less or use less yeast nutrient in this beer the next time I make it. There's a little bit of flexibility you have there you can also ferment in a shallower fermenter that tends to increase esters as well. Very similar to like what you would do for an open fermented Hefeweizen. Technically, you can also open ferment these beers. So there's a lot of things you can do to create extra esters and still get the same level of um, high quality fermentation. That being said, I personally am still incredibly happy with this beer and incredibly proud of myself for making it. So that is an absolute win. And if you make this beer, and you follow my recipe to the T, just don't drink it before six months. And I think you'll be happy. In three months, it was an okay beer. At six months, this thing is blowing my mind. I really do think that this is gonna dethrone the triple in terms of what was the best beer that I've made over the last 12 months, rolling period. That was a very, very, very good beer. But this one takes the cake, because I like my dark beers. And this is on a whole other level. This may potentially be my favorite beer of my own that I've ever made. And it's pretty damn close to that West Letter and 12 that I brought back from Belgium, so I'm happy. This beer is an incredible combination of drinkability and complexity and just sheer delicious flavors. Um, it takes me straight back to the courtyard at West Flatteren, which is why I picked this glass for it, because it does feel so similar to West Letter and 12. Um, I'm not saying I'm making a beer that's as good as West Letter in 12 by any means, but it certainly reminds me of it and it feels very close. I'm very happy with it overall. It just goes to show that some things in life are certainly worth waiting for. And this is one of them. Anyway, guys, having waited about six months to put this video out, it would mean a ton to me if you were able to hit that like button, that subscribe button, and comment down below with your thoughts and reactions on all of this stuff. If you want to support me, that means a ton to me as well. And a great way to do so is to pick up a t-shirt from my t-shirt store, or to check out my Patreon, to check out the super thanks button, or my channel memberships options as well. All of these things help me out a ton, and it means the world to me that you guys are supporting me. It really does help keep me going in this passion project of brewing and sharing this stuff with you guys all. 
If you want to follow me on more than just YouTube, I'm also available on Instagram and Facebook as The Apartment Brewer. So check that out for some more frequent content updates. Last but certainly not least, if you are still here, thank you very much for still being here, watching all the way to the end of the video. It makes a big difference to me. And so, this one goes out to you guys. Till the next one, cheers. I'm not gonna chug this, because it's too precious to chug.